Hello everyone and welcome to another Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport. I'm Ed Foster and for the first time ever I'm joined by Motorsport's new deputy editor Joe Dunn on my right. Joe, a very warm welcome to your first ever talk show. Thank you very much Ed, looking forward to it and looking forward to, uh, to our guest uh, today as well. Our, and our guest today is Stuart Turner. Um, a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming all the way down to London, especially for this. It's much appreciated. Pleasure. Um, now, 90% of our audience will know exactly who you are. And judging by the number of questions, um, that's certainly the case. But for those of you that don't, um, author of Twice Lucky, My Life in Motorsport. And you actually started off as an accountant before becoming a writer for Motoring News and then eventually moving on to... Uh, the British Motor Corporation. Uh, to say I was an accountant is an exaggeration. <laughs> I was a wages clerk struggling to cope with a correspondence course to become an accountant, but literally a wages clerk. No interest in motorsport at all. My first connection with motorsport, I caught the tail end of national service and spent a year in Cornwall learning to speak Russian. And some of us were out, I could call it manoeuvres, but we were wandering around in Cornwall, saw some blokes pushing a funny blue coloured car on an airfield with no mug guards, helped them to push it, and realised that it was Prince Beera with one of his Grand Prix cars. So if you're going to get involved in motorsport, pushing a Grand Prix car in Cornwall is as good a way to start as any. Came back, finished his national service, back to a wages clerk, still not, didn't know anything about motorsport at all, until a sister, boyfriend, picked her up on a Sunday lunchtime, said they were going to do a rally, what the hell that was, did I want to join them? in a Rover 14. I mean, that's pretty glamorous stuff, you realise that. I sat in the back, she got lost, thank goodness. I picked up the maps and some freak thing, I don't know what, I found I liked this navigation. And my life, literally, that Sunday lunchtime, changed completely because I just fell almost like a drug addict for motorsport. Joined the North Stas Motor Club in the Potteries, got involved in those days in the 50s, you could do, well, three consecutive years. I did 60 rallies a year. It was even possible to do occasional rallies on a Friday evening, always plenty to choose from on a Saturday night. And if you got back in time, you could do a club rally on a Sunday afternoon. So it was possible to do three rallies in one weekend, 60 in a year. But you can't do that amount and try to become an accountant. And I started to help to run the Motor Club magazine for the North Staffs. And I think it still applies today. I sent it to what was then Autosport and Motoring News. And as a result of that, got asked to write the occasional rally article for them. And I put a note at one of these articles, I think I did it to both, but certainly to Motoring News, if ever you've got a full-time job, give me a shout. Three weeks later, I was rally editor at Motoring News purely from freakish Sunday lunchtime rally, doing a club magazine, sending it. No wonder I called my book twice lucky. It could not have been lucky. It was ridiculous. And the joy was joining Motoring News for your motorsport readers. It was the formative years. Bill Boddy and Dennis Jenkinson were on the next floor. I was working with gods because you know, Bill Boddy was a legend. So was Dennis Jenkinson. Lucky sod is the word you're looking for. What what would Bill and Jenks like to work with? Because I've sort of I've heard mixed. Because Gordon Crickshank, um, who writes still writes for the magazine now, he he arrived as they were still at the magazine. He said they were you know they were as you said you know gods when you arrive. Actually, they were quite difficult to work with. Well, they weren't for us because they didn't have a lot to do with us. They acknowledged us on the stairs and whatever. And to his credit, Bill Bill. Bill Body for many years has kept in touch with just little scribble notes occasionally. And, uh, Jenks was uh, elusive because he was off on the continent all the time. Uh, the only story I remember of Jenks is he was alleged that he didn't punctuate his articles because, quote, there's somebody back at the office with a pepper pot full of commas and full stops and, and sprinkle it on the copy. So we didn't see a lot. They were, I don't say they were aloof, that would be quite wrong, but we weren't close. But there's no reason why we should be. We were a weekly, and it's rather sad, you probably know that uh, John Blunsden 
died recently, was one of the editors. He was the editor and I was there. And I remember John, that Daryl Reach and I, Daryl Darryl was the deputy editor, we'd be at the printers at St Albans, John would be back in City Road. We'd suddenly find we got a page missing for this week's issue. We'd ring John in City Road, we got a page short. Motorcycle courier, two hours later, thousand words from John Blunson with a sports car racing or whatever, whatever. He could turn out immaculate and no sense that it had been done in a quick two hours. He was, he was a lovely guy to work with and a very, very good journalist. I forgot what the question was, but that's the answer. Well, you mentioned uh, on coming up the stairs here, where I bumped into you, uh, this lo- lovely, lovely building, isn't it? Um, th- that um, uh, Bill Body sort of looked down slightly on motorsport news. Yes, or, or news. I think they felt, um, "What's this upstart?" But not in a, not in an objectionable way. They just, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't sort of necessarily hold out the hand of friendship, but they didn't punch us. You know, it was a relative thing. We were a new upstart to some extent. And what we have to remember, of course, Motoring News, now Motorsport News, started as a motoring magazine. It wasn't cleverly motor. We had a Patrolman Fred article we used to put in each week, a couple of hundred, three hundred words from the RAC about, you know, how to jack your spare wheel up or whatever, the Patrolman Fred. We'll have to put two Patrolman Freds in this week because we short a copy. <laughs> Heady days. Heady days. Heady everything really. was that easy. You don't know what you've missed, you youngsters. <laughs> um, you, we, you were talking about that Sunday afternoon that totally changed your life. What do you think it was about the navigation that that got you? Was it the sort of speed, the sense of adventure, or the organisation? I've never been a very good driver. I don't rate myself as a driver. But the joy of those days was the Ordnance Survey map was paramount. And therefore, you could look at an entry list for a rally for a Saturday night. And a typical rally would start 10 o'clock on a Saturday night to 6 o'clock the next morning. You could go flat out all night, not go wrong, lose 10 minutes and win. So if that wasn't road racing, and it, I don't know what was. But the point was, the navigation was critical we even used to go out, the co-drivers, navigators, we'd go out on a weekend when there wasn't a rally, going round country lanes, and if there was a fork and it was a grass triangle, we'd mark it as a triangle. So if I'm navigating for you and we come to that junction, I don't say fork right, I say fork right at the triangle. You therefore know I'm on the right road because I've told you a triangle. And the other thing we used to do, if there's a line on a map showing a gate, we go round before a week before the rally and put which way the gate opened. So when I get out of the car, when you, when you come to a gate, I don't run to that side if the handle's that side. You've got 10 gates in a rally and you save five seconds on each, you might save a tiny, tiny attention to detail, which I think in some ways possibly paid on later. We may get onto the BM stuff later, but it paid because I used a lot of British co-drivers and that same nitpicking attention to detail, I think, did no harm on Monte Carlo rallies. And how, how did you become the competitions manager in 1961 at BMC from writing for Motoring News and rallying yourself? Partly, again, because of the map reading. Because, for instance, in 1959, Auto Union came over with a German driver. He spoke no English. I speak no German. They asked me to navigate for him because I could read these maps and his German co-driver probably never seen an Ordnance Survey map. And then the following year, Eric Carlson, who did speak English, of course, he asked me to go within a Saab. Again, Gunnar Palm, Eric's normal co-driver, far better co-driver than I was, certainly good enough as a driver to drive on a rally, never mind navigate. But he, he, he didn't like these Ordnance Survey maps, so I went with Eric and we were lucky enough to win. But what my lucky break, you mentioned BMC, Pat Moss's co-driver, Anne Wisdom, or Anne Riley she became, she got car sick. She was wonderful. I've seen Pat pull into the side of the road, open the door, Anne's been car sick, shut the door, they've gone on and won the rally. That's how determined she was on a continental rally. But the hell with piddling about on one inch maps on a Saturday night if you're car sick. So Pat asked me to go with her on British rallies. 
I got a call from her saying, Marcus Chambers, who was then the team manager, he wants uh, wants me to take a mini. And I said, you know, what's a mini? And Pat and I won the first ever event with an 850 mini. All I can remember is Pat spent the whole night moaning how slow the damn thing was, and I spent the whole night moaning because of the ankle deep in water, because they all... They all leaked in the initial minis. But the point was, it gave me an entree to the team. It was pure luck. If Anne Wisdom hadn't been car sick and I hadn't gone to the rallies with Pat, I wouldn't have got to know people at Abingdon. Luck. <laughs> What's that, Will you, you pinch me or shall I? <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned the mini there, and obviously a large part of your career was um, and success was alongside this mini and with the mini. Um, it, People obviously, they didn't take to it straight away, did they? Because, I mean, it was so different to Drivers things that it I came approached before. to take a Mini who'd been driving a Healy thought it was a demotion. And if somebody had got to go into Abingdon, um, nearly a mile from the workshop, take the Mini, can't I take a Healy? It was not seen as the glamorous thing it was. But we forget the timing for that car, the Beatles, Carnaby Street the 50s late 50s the country was coming out of the war it was in where we were free the timing could not have been better it, it just caught on and paddy's first win we were on the sunday night of the london Palladium, which got i think three times the number of viewing figures that strictly come dancing gets with the rolling stones and tommy could be it, it, it was just perfect timing it was a lucky yeah, timing. Yeah, I mean, well, as you say, it was such a wonderful time, especially for rallying. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering, could you sort of paint us a picture of what rallying was like in the 60s? Because I think a, a lot of uh, viewers and, and listeners will, you know, fans of rallying, and they'll watch the likes of um, Loeb and whoever it is rallying nowadays. Or lo well, not so much Loeb anymore. Um, but it's such, I mean, it's a different sport compared to what it was in the 60s because well, a, I've got a quote from you here actually um, the first international rally you did um, with John contained endless zigzags to ensure that no Michelin guide recommend recommendations were missed en route it's, it's, it's very different <laughs> to what it's like well, nowadays for instance if you want to make old rally drivers cry just say one word Liège this was the thing that started in Belgium went down to Bulgaria and it was 96 hours with one hour break. 96 hours is four days and four nights. One hour break, not per day, one hour over the 96 hours. Pat Moss won it one year with Anne, and they said that they were hallucinating. They were seeing burning lorries. There weren't any burning lorries. I did with John Sprinzel in a Sprite. We won a class, I think. 96 hours in a Sprite. I wanted a midwife when I got out of the car there, not a bloody mechanic. It was amazing. But it, the sort of event, to give you an example, if there were two sections, if there was a long section with a hill at each end, but a flat piece of road in the middle, well, that's not a problem. You start there, do the hill, go like hell across the valley. Oh, they neutralised the middle bit, so you got two hill climbs. So everybody lost time on the two hills from that section to that section. And the other thing they did, the organiser, I think his aim was to have one finisher. I think he got down to nine. But he had a table for the police showing A to B, two hours. B to D, B to C, two, 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 whatever. whatever. Those are the official hours, Mr Chief Constable. On the other side, which they didn't show to the police, they had the opening times of the controls. So you say I've got five sections of two hours, so you should reach the fifth control ten hours after you've started. Fine, do that, but that control closed nine and a half hours after the start. Police don't know that, so unless you were aware of this sneaky double timing system, you got chucked out of the rally. And the final event, the organiser said, I'm, with tears in his eyes, I can still see him at this driver's meeting, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really upset. The police have insisted we put in secret speed checks to stop you speeding. 
and then he held up a card with the location of the secret speed checks written on them while we wrote them down. Can you imagine the spirit of why people are nostalgic about an event like that? The Alpine was a massive thing covering all the major French passes. The Monty had got the extra glamour. He started from Minsk, you're starting from Athens, he's starting from Aberdeen or Swindon or whatever. <laughs> you know, will he be able to get through the snow? There's all that excitement. It wasn't television. You've got Raymond Baxter, 10 o'clock or whatever it was, every night talking about it. And more important, the thing that you got then and you don't have now, you got it on the front page of the national papers. So it was part of the general consciousness. If there's a World Rally Championship today, you're very lucky to find it in any national paper. And if, if it's more than one line, you're really lucky. So with all of that put together, it was quite a glamorous time. So it helped the Mini along. I don't know if you're covering it later, but it was also the reason why BMC folded, but perhaps we can talk about that later. One before we move on to that, um, you mentioned Pat Moss a couple of times. And I just yeah. wondered what your um, sort of memories of her are, and uh, more broadly, uh, women in rallying back in those days. Um, well, uh, and also there were jokes about Marcus Chambers and his ladies because he had about with Nancy Mitchell, Sheila Van Dam people. There were lots and lots of women drivers in rallying. It, it's extraordinary just how many there were. Pat, well, going back to. Say, the mark of a rally driver or race driver is when you finish your practice or a stage, what did so-and-so do? If the other competitors are asking what you did, what time you did, you're a serious threat. They always ask what time Pat had done. You know, I, Pat wasn't the best woman driver. Pat was in the top three or four drivers full stop. She really was terrific. I once asked Eric Carlson, who was quickest, him or his wife, Pat Moss. I think I was, but only a little bit. <laughs> that about sums it up. <laughs> I would have said that Sterling's Millie Miglia win was sensational. Pat, 96 hours in an Austin 3000, winning the Liège, I would rate that equal to Sterling's Millie Miglia. Were they, were they competitive uh, uh, between them, Sterling and Pat? Well... It was interesting to go to the house because don't forget, and I, you probably got it in your files. How was the Sterling and Pat's father a dentist, wasn't he? How was he racing at Indianapolis in the thirties? You, you'd be difficult. I can't imagine a dentist doing it now. Is it? And the mother was a British women's rally champion, so for sure as hell they were competitive. But they got on well. They respected each other. I think one of Sterling's. I suspect one of his nicest moments. He was, I remember being at some fun. He was introduced as, Stur as Pat Moss's brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, we uh, soon after arriving at BMC. Am I right in thinking that you tested Jackie Stewart at Goodwood? I'm not um, even sure what. What happened? We used to go to Sebring, and uh, can I just go back and how BMC worked? I was. We were based at Abingdon, which helped because we were away from Longbridge and all the, the big Cowley, the big come A small factory with a team spirit. I used to sit in the boardroom each day for lunch. One of the guys had been a riding mechanic with Nuvolari. And as an example, when we got back off the... Um, I'm sure if you go to, go to Abingdon, stop elderly people in the street, which was the best, a Sprite or a midget? Built from, oh, no question, the midget was, of course. You know, that's the spirit it was there. And uh, we got back from the Monte after Paddy had won. The flags were flying. And I said to John Thornley, the general manager, at last you've recognised the mini. No, no, dear boy, the flags are flying. And MJ was 17th overall, but he's won the GT category. <laughs> but anyway, I'm digressing. John and I did the agenda and then we'd hold a competition committee meeting once a year at Longbridge with Alec Isigonis would come, George Harriman the chairman, Brian Turner the PR director, Donald Healy and John Cooper and John Thornley and I and then we usually gave Donald Healy, I think it was 25,000 out of my motorsport budget for Sebring because beating the Triumphs was important for the American market and 
we used to go to Silverstone, not Goodwood, Silverstone, to test a few drives. And we'd take any car that was in the workshop and say, right, get in, do three laps, now you get in. And just, how will you cope with a weird event over in America like Sebring? And Ken Tyrrell, who has always been a good friend, phoned once and said, um, do you mind if I bring some young driver? People say I should try. And we said, no, why not? So this lad came up. He was as quick as so-and-so in this. He was quicker than so-and-so in that. And I can still see John Cooper running up saying, sign him, sign him, Jackie Stewart. It was, it was just one of those freakish things. But more bizarre, the first time we went to Sebring, America, BMC in New York, used to find us a couple of drivers for the team for local publicity. And one year we went, I couldn't understand it. Our pits were surrounded by quite attractive women. I knew it wasn't me, and I didn't think it was our British drivers, till somebody pointed out that this bloke New York had found one of the two, McQueen, was actually Steve McQueen. So I was Steve McQueen's team manager for, for one race. <laughs> Was it's luck. You see, I keep coming back to luck. <laughs> what was what was Steve like? Was it was he? A, I mean, I think he was a capable driver. Well, he, he was a capable driver. He had a I. mixed reputation, but the point was, I certainly never went to the pictures. I hadn't got time, so we treated him as a normal driver. We didn't. This is God. Let's worship Steve McQueen. And I think because we treated him as one of the lads, he fitted in all right. As far as I remember, I don't remember any adverse memories at all. I think that's, uh, Derek Bell always says that he was on the set of Le Mans, all he wanted to do was hang out with the drivers. Yes. And actually yeah, he, yes. Was, he wanted to be a driver. Signing autographs was a damn nuisance almost, but he's uh, a nice guy. You, you mentioned Ken Tyrrell there, what, and you were good friends with him. Was, uh, being friends, I suppose, was, was a very different prospect to being an employed driver by Ken, and I guess you did avoided fr the froth jobs. Um, we, yes. Um, you could enjoy having an argument with Ken, just as you could with a genius like Keith Duckworth. I mean, Keith, I'm digressing totally now, but Keith would sometimes, I gather, phone people and say, a bit bored, let's have an argument. And he finally phoned to have an argument. But Ken, Ken used to come and visit and we went to them, my wife Margaret and I, and Ken and his wife, we got, we got on well, he was a nice guy. I like his diet. And it's ironic when you look at today's Formula One with the bloody transportation and so on, I think at times, I'm not sure if Ken didn't take his cars on trailers behind transit vans. It was almost like that. Amazing. The, um, when you first arrived at BMC, what, what's, who was it that decided to take the Mini from you know, this wonderful creation by Sigonis into rallying? Was that was it a, a simple decision, or because I mean, obviously the drivers didn't want to drive it. The, the there were, must Mark, have been question marks over its yeah, capabilities. Marcus Chambers was in some pressure at times. He would get a phone call, sales chief of Woolsey. Seems to be doing a lot with riders at the moment. Aren't you going kind to of give Woolsey a chance and that sort of thing? And it was automatic that the range they got were not going to be, apart from the big Healy, they were not going to be capable of winning outright on major events. So, well, it's a funny looking thing, but we might as well give it a try. And then, of course, once John Cooper got involved, once there was a hint of it, and I suppose Pat winning the first rally, the 850, and other people started to grow with it, and it suddenly got on. And it helped me, because I made two changes over Marcus, which he would have made if he hadn't decided to retire from competitions. And one was to reduce the number of models. Because we forget now, because World Rallying gets virtually zero national newspaper coverage, the magazine, the, the newspapers aren't full of ads, success ads, after every rally. So Marcus would be, and I was initially, you're going into a rally, yeah, we want to win, but what's going to be the ad tagline for the ad on the Monday morning? class win for the Wolsey 1500 if that's all you've got to advertise because if you book your space you need something to put in it but I was able to get rid of the Wolseys and stuff because the Mini and the RCA 3000 and the second change which Marcus would have made automatically because we suddenly got potential winners we needed what's the phrase we needed to move from gentlemen to players as drivers. Other sports were doing the same. I'm not in any way 
being derogatory about the gentleman. But for instance, the Morley brothers would have been perfect for the Liège. They were huge success on Alpine rallies, and in the Healy 3000, their approach would have been perfect for this 96-hour event. They wouldn't do it. Why? Owned half of Suffolk. They were farmers. It clashed with the harvest. They got their priorities right. I needed players, but they would. I wish they'd become players and bugger the harvest. It would have been marvellous. So I was able to reduce the number of, sorry, reduce the number of models we took out, which reduces the number of spares you've got to clutter the place up with, and also reduce the drivers and just concentrate. And then the other lucky break was because of sitting with the German and then Eric Carlson, I realised that these Scandinavians or f foreign drivers have got to... I mean, it sounds bizarre, but Marcus told me that his first works rally drivers for the BMC team were picked by the MG Car Club. Now, people smile if you say that, but why not? If you started from scratch, who else are you going to go to? Who's, who's the quick driver? I don't know. Ask the club. They might know because they've been running sprints and hill climbs. But I'd seen... I did a, my last rally I did as a competitor was in an Austin Erie with a fellow called Derek Assel. And we were waiting, we pulled up behind a Mercedes at the start of a special stage. And it was Ergen uh, uh, Boring, who was the European champion. And as we were waiting to start the stage, they swapped over the co-driver, got into the driver's seat, and Boring got in the passenger seat. So naturally, at the end of that stage, I looked at the times, and they murdered everybody. And the co-driver was Rano Altonen, one of the Finnish drivers. So it wasn't difficult to see. So I came back from that rally with his phone number. It wasn't difficult to see. He was a bit quick. I, I had actually watched him be a bit quick. So that was a look. And then he, there's something about the Scandinavians. I don't know whether they still do it, but they've never been slow at recommending other Scandinavians, whether they wanted the Finns or the Swedes to get onto the world scene, I don't know. But whereas a, you know, maybe, I don't know, but perhaps a German driver, if there's a young, quick lad, they won't tell anybody about him. But the Finns were quite happy, and I think uh, Hanno Mickler, Timo Mackinen and Rano Alto, oh, you want to keep an eye on this guy, Hanno Mickler or Harry Vatten or whatever. So th then I got accused of the Finnish invasion, but they were quick, so why not use them? Do you think, sorry, do, do you think there was a, a sort of uh, a, a more competitive streak in some of the Scandinavian drivers uh, in the sense that winning was all uh, when they started to arrive on the scene compared think, maybe to the British although they were drivers. polite about each other, I think if you two are competing and he's beating you, you're going to try hard to beat him. So I think having a competitive team does tend to give an edge. The joyous thing is that they all stayed good friends. But I think it helped putting British co-drivers with them. That, uh, you know, we... And to go... I mentioned earlier about that, the map reading, tiny attention detail. One of the Montes, the ones we got thrown out of, actually, I'm sure we were the only team that put out garden thermometers on the special sections before the rally to check whether that corner there freezes every night. Tiny, tiny whether it made any difference, but it made us feel we were we we're close to being on you know competitive as we can. Let's check that corner, and we forget. I think motorsport as a whole is a bit guilty. The Formula One drivers tend to thank their team. But after we'd been thrown out, the following year, Rano Alton won and we got our revenge for winning. But you could argue that one of the mechanics played as important. I got the credits, team manager win. Rano got the credits, his co-driver. But there was one section which was critical to get the tyres right. And on that section, one corner was critical. If you got your tyres right for that piece, you probably got the tyres, studied tyres for the whole section. And one of the mechanics, Robin Vokins, I put in the team instructions, go to that section, drive into that corner, you know which one it is, Robin, check the conditions, phone, and we'll decide on the tyres. He got there, John Dobbs had closed the road early. Most people, I think including me, would have just parked the car, phoned and driven on. He parked his car, ran a mile 
into that corner, checked the corner, ran a mile back with the ribald comments from the spectators, phoned me, we got the tyres right, we won by 13 seconds the rally. The right tyres on that second were 20 seconds. He won the rally. Or you could argue that was the importance of the team. I forget what the question was, but again, that's the answer. Um, I, um, I'm going to come back to the, uh, the Mini in general in a second, but uh, you were just talking about the year that you got thrown out of Monte Carlo. Um, it, it's, you know, it's a well-known story, but just for those that haven't heard it, what's, what happened? Um, because it's still amazing to this day. It was a small day. thing over lighting. With the bulbs in those days, wouldn't dip, so we were dipping to auxiliary lights. We checked, and Henry Taylor at Ford, because Roger Clark got chucked out as well. We checked, we went into that event 100% convinced we were legal. It wasn't even an issue we, we needed, until we come, came up against this brick wall. And I still think there was an element of, they must have been cheating to be doing these times. We've got to get them out there. If it hadn't been on the lighting, could have been the colour of Paddy Hopkirk's socks that have thrown us out. It, it would literally, and that's that's what caused it. it, was, it was, there's one thing I've forgotten totally. In those rallies in the 50s where we were doing 60 rallies, I'm, I don't know, I'm ashamed or puzzled to say, we took drugs. Really? All, the, all the Furore in sports today, the Olympics and all that, we, I took drugs every Saturday night. And what I didn't go into the back streets of Birmingham to find a dealer. I went to my GP and said, I've got to stay up from 10 till 6 in the morning. Oh, you better have some of these. And we took benzodrines or dexodrines or whatever. That. And it was, and I, I think, although the war had been over by 10, 15 years, it's possible that the more elderly GPs have been given these things to spit fire pilots. I don't know. But we just took drugs. And Sterling Moss, I think, was given one by Fangio once. I, yeah, I think for the Mini Minia. Yeah. yeah, and it was sort of uh, it, was, it was a given. But I mean, t if you were going to stay up all night, Take drugs. it's better to do that and fall asleep. Yeah. The only uh, there's, problem a, was there's a message for the Royal Automobile Club talk shows: take drugs. Um, that <laughs> yeah, comes with a lot of terms and conditions, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> slide down, so I particularly if you're in something <laughs> small like a sprite, they tended to cause flatulence. But this, <laughs> this is not the. This is not the venue to talk about that, obviously. Um, we, we've got lots of readers' questions, so I, I must delve into them. And we got one uh, from Joseph Pierce, and we, we talked quite a lot about the Mini, but he wants to know how much of an influence do you think the Mini had on the direction of rallying as a sport? I think sort of how, how important was it um, for, for rallying in general? You know, we talked about Carnaby Street and... In the era. That, that was the, that helped the mini. I don't. I think it drew attention to you because Paddy. What we forget with Paddy's f the first Monty win, there was a handicap system which we think was designed to help small French cars, and a small British car slipped under the system and won. A Ford Falcon. Which would you rather go around twisty mountain icy roads, a mini or a Ford Falcon? The Falcon beat us by two minutes. Alan Mann, it was one of the performances, but this f funny little mini took all the publicity. And poor old Alan with his Falcon. I think I've seen around one of the bends, somebody had written Ford Falcon Autobahn because hurtling up a mountain in you know, a Falcon. So we were lucky t in that respect. I don't think the mini changed things to that extent. What it did do, it, in my opinion, contributed to the death of BMC, the mini. And, and how so? Two reasons. One, they lost money on everyone. And I know Ford people that were involved in analysing it and they were definitely losing money. But more important, I think it made Alec Isigonis too powerful. Nice guy. He, was always, he always swore the Mini had never been invented for motorsport, but he was always quite quick to come down to Monte Carlo and have dinner with Fangio or whatever if we'd won the damn thing. But it got to the stage within the company, you started to hear people talk about not Isigonis, Aragonis. And what made me leave, I went to see him over something on the Mini for the rally, was no problem. Then went to see the sales chief, it's an old story, I've told it in the end of the time. Went to see the sales chief over something else. Oh, I know, we've got to go behind the Iron Curtain. 
which would you rather go, A or country, A or country, B? OK, we'll go that one. And then just finishing coffee, I said, well, well, we're thinking of using Austin 1800 on rallies, just to see what it's like. Oh, oh, if you could get Alec to alter the position of the handbrake, you would help us, because the customers don't like it. Sitting with Alec, sitting with the sales chief, I could see Alec in his office, because I'd just come from his office. So I pointed to Alec Isigonis and said to the sales chief, why don't you tell him? Answer, oh, he won't listen to sales. I repeat, the Mini was the reason that BMC collapsed. Amazing. Um, but that, and I, you know, then, you know, if, you, if you're talking to a motor club audience and you want to get a laugh, you don't have to say two words, Austin Electro. <laughs> Although I know... No. I, it's no, worked no, again. Sorry, <laughs> um, so we, we've mentioned him a lot, uh, Paddy Hopkirk, and he's so intrinsically linked with the Mini. He was obviously a, a great driver. Um, what, was he just very well suited to the Mini, and that's why they had so much success together? Or was he actually successful in, in He was successful he was in as a driver, and he was very successful also as a personality, Still today, he gets invited to things from that angle. On sheer ability, I've sat with Paddy on panels and things, and Paddy and Tony Fall, who's no longer with us, quite often are asked who was the quickest. They have no doubt of Timo Mackinnon. And the year after Paddy's win, the 65 win of Timo Mackinnon, that was probably... Maybe Colin McRae have done something better, but that was probably one of three great rally drives. And people think of the Finns, and Timo in particular, as a bit of a wild man. But there's an interesting aspect. Timo, who with Paul Easter, who was a good driver in his own right, with him, Timo was very reluctant to use pace notes. You know, this 100 metres hard left, medium right, happy. Very reluctant. He just wanted the key things. He didn't want all this nonsense. And we thought, that's a bit weird. And he said it was a distraction. That was 50 years ago. In the last two years, two different universities have done an analysis of sat-navs and they are bad for your driving because it's a distraction. If you're coming to a tricky junction, switch the damn thing off. Timo was doing that 50 years ago. Interesting, because uh, Sterling Moss, is, he, he always maintains that uh, rally drivers can never be going flat flat out because they have to listen yeah. and they're computing all I that. I don't know about you, maybe because of that, but if I'm going to, we live in a village where we have to join a busy road. And as I get to that T-junction to join a bit, and my wife's looking that way, and I, I switch the radio off because I don't want to be listening to that while we're worried about a dangerous road. Well, Timo was doing that. Don't call him a rock ape fin the Scandinavian. He was a bright bloke. Whether he, well, he just felt it was a distraction. You're, you're famous for saying, to, if you want to win, get a fin. And, um, you know, you're, you mentioned it earlier about bringing, you know, the fins into the, more fins into the sport. What was it about them that made them so good? Was it because they grew up in where they That's grew up? That's possibly or? the thing, because the British rallies, don't forget, all those through the 50s, you could become a famous British rally driver and a winner by being a very good British rally driver or by having a, being a competent British rally driver and having Fred so-and-so, who's a British rally champion, navigator. So you could get a disproportionate reputation because of the teamwork which is fine it's a great thing but you're not going to beat somebody else going over the terrain you're on a straight piece of alpine road that was the difference i, I don't say I, I hope i wasn't the totally besotted with the fins i mean some of the british drivers i didn't give drives to will probably confirm your your <laughs> statement but no uh, um paddy and tony fall and people like that and as an example one of the most interesting bits of how you need, what you need to be to be a rally driver. Before the London to Mexico World Cup rally with Ford, Walter Hayes, the genius who ran for Ford Public Affairs, he, I don't say lumbered me, but put Jimmy Greaves into the team. 
Jimmy came out to the Ford Motorsport Department near Chelmsford with a horde of photographers. Oh, God, this is all we need. They took all the pictures, and then he said, get in, and I got in an escort with him. We set off around the circuit. As soon as we were out of sight of the journalists, he pulled in. If I'm making a p*** to myself, tell me, and we'll stop. I said, if that's your attitude, Jimmy, we're going to get on. And on the event, it was a bit embarrassing because some of the South American countries, we were there with the escort and rally driver. Though the locals wanted Jimmy Green's autograph. He was a footballer. The hell with the rally driver. But on the event, they ran out of tyres on the, the car he was in. Not speaking the language, he got on a bus and found one of our service cars. That was the deter He got the determination. You've got to have a car... You've got to have the driver with the determination, and you've got to have the you've got to have the team behind you. You've got to have the mechanics. Um, something to, I didn't mention at the start is obviously once um, in '67 you took a job at Castrol, and then you went on to become director of motorsports for Ford in first Europe. Of all, no, yeah. first of all, mo manager. Yeah, the manager of advanced vehicle and then operations, and then public affairs, and then came uh, back. Yeah. What? What's, sorry, what what was it like going from? Well, obviously, I cast her in the middle, but we're going from BMC to Ford. Was it? It must have been quite a different environment. Well, to I don't know whether any of your viewers have got ever got needs to get budgets approved, but at BMC, I mentioned how we had our annual meeting. Margaret and I made the accountant at MGs who looked after my budget. We just happened to make him godfather to our first daughter. That's not a bad way of getting budget approved, I tell you. When I walked into Ford, I walked through the door of Boreham. Somebody came and said, good morning, I'm Brian Brackery. I'm your financial controller. Hand on heart, I wasn't sure what a financial <laughs> controller was. But it was the atmosphere and the mechanics. You could almost have swapped the teams the same joyous spirit and ability and sadly last week there was a funeral of one of the top born Mick Jones was one of the top born people and I remember on an RAC rally up in Yorkshire deep snow cold as hell an escort pulled in needed a clutch change Mick changed the clutch nine minutes staggered to his feet on the point of collapse the second escort came in so he did that in nine minutes as well that's the sort of spirit you need to back up the drivers. And then it feeds on each other. The drivers know the people. Are you see it in Formula One, of course you do. Did, did, did you know at the time what's, what a special era that was for rallying and, and for Ford as well in rallying, you know, with the escorts? And you know, even now they're looked back on so fondly. Um, and certainly there's a features editor at Motorsport Magazine, uh, Simon Aaron, who... You can't get enough of a Ford Escort. Oh, somebody, <laughs> but I think we're all a little yeah, bit like that. I think what summed it up, I was I forget where I was recently, I said to somebody, what was to you was the spirit of rallying? Roger Clark sideways as an Escort. That summed up to them rallying, you know, the, the joy of it. And of course we forget Timo Mackinnon did a hat trick on the RAC. Well, there were a lot, and they weren't depending on Ordnance Survey map reading. They were flat out through the forests. So that rather belayed any idea that he was just put in the team for kicks. He was put in because he was the best at it. And Roger, yeah, Roger was great. Great bloke. He won the... Uh, Roger won the World Cup rally for Ford, but he didn't finish. And the reason is the Scandinavians, and I'll, I'll downplay the Scandinavians, they went out to South America... And we were concerned, 14,000 feet in the Andes. We're going to need oxygen for the cars, the crews. Do we go three up or two up? Or what else? The Scandinavians went out and came back. Must be three up in a big car. I'm not convinced that the weight of a third person makes up for, you know, the benefits make up for the weight. And Roger, luckily, was the last one to go out. And I said to Roger... Just do one of your down-to-earth practical appraisals. Do we need oxygen and so on? And it, it was an apoc apocryphal story, but it was alleged. I said to him, get to 14,000 feet, find a girl, make love, and decide whether you want oxygen. And it is alleged that Roger phoned me to say, 
we knocked the need ox and I couldn't find a girl at 14,000 feet but I had no ill effects at all when I did it 14 times at 1,000 feet. Now, I didn't. <laughs> There's an apocryphal story, but that was, a, in fact, on the, we we I took Roger's advice. We're going two up. We even changed the rear lights on the escorts to save a kilo each side, and I put a note in my instructions to the drivers: if you give them coins in change, chuck it away. Don't carry the weight. I mean, telling drivers to throw money away. Of course, that was a hopeless task. But that, and then on the event itself. This co-driver, there was a crash and Roger was put out of the event, but he was, the 14,000 feet, his widow asked me to tell it at his funeral, but when I got into the pulpit, I chickened out, I'm ashamed to say. <laughs> Sorry, Joey. I was just interested, uh, um, I mean, you touched on it then about the popularity of rallying during that um, during, during that era, um, and uh, Jimmy Greaves coming to the factory. Um, how do you account for its popularity at that stage, uh, and especially compared to nowadays, when arguably it's on, it, it's not quite as uh, high profile as it used to be. I honestly don't know. There's an aspect of motorsport that I think we need. To, there's nothing we can do about it, but television perhaps hasn't helped us. If Andy Murray mishits and curses. You can lip read what he says. If a footballer has a go at the referee, you can lip read what he says. Any sport, snooker, you can see the beads of sweat as they put. Can you tell whether it's Hamilton or Rosberg? Of course you can't, because quite properly they're wearing safety equipment. But it's taking away that interpersonal, particularly when coming here, nine out of ten people are playing about with mobile, this, that, and the other. So it's the interface. Which, which, of course, you could see more back then. I think maybe the car hadn't become quite as common. And I think there's, there's, there seems to be an issue, I don't know if you find it, with youngsters. Modern cars, they do all look the same, don't they? Most middle-sized cars, there's an element of sameness about them that wasn't quite in those days. You look at them, you look 10 cars from Monte Carlo rally back then to today, and there's a slight difference, uh, you know, a Mini against a Porsche, for instance, and stuff like that. And uh, you mentioned earlier as well about um, the advertising side of things. I was wondering, uh, you're obviously involved in how, how important was uh, success in the sporting arena in rallying to subsequent sales on the on the high street? If to, you know. I don't know. The it, There's some evidence, I think, that... It, motorsport works best in small markets. I think you'll find that Saab with Eric Carlson did better where they were starting from a low base. If you're doing 2%, it's probably easier to get it up to 6% than if you're doing 16% to get it to 26 or whatever. And we before the London to Mexico, we sent a car on the rally of the Incas in Peru with Tony Fall and Gunnar Palmer, Eric's co-driver, and it won. And the, the dealers there said, oh, that was good for us. You know, they, they'd felt a bit of a buzz. But if you're doing 30% of the market, as Ford were sometimes, it's probably quite difficult to make it 35, never mind, never mind 45. But in the back, going back to the BMC days, you've got Triumph advertising, you've got Roots advertising, you've got Ford advertising, you've got BMC advertising, so it was part of the marketing scene. Now, I'd, uh, we haven't got too long left, so oh, I want to sorry. make sure I can... No, not at all. It's, um, it's been brilliant so far. We still, we, we have, we've still got 15 minutes or so, so we're not panicked at all. Um, but we, I must ask some of these readers' questions. Um, the, uh, there's one here from Robert Baird, who was wondering whether you ever found out what the demon tweak was that Ralph Broad did to the suspensions of his minis to make them corner better than the BMC car, uh, works cars? No comment. <laughs> no comment. Okay. I one of I don't know whether it's a I don't know whether it's a, been a plus or a minus, but technically, I'm illiterate, and, lit, and with people like Brian Hart, Don Moore, one of the unsung heroes of the mini. Mini tuning, Don Moore was brilliant, but with Brian Hart, Keith Duckworth, Alec Isagonis, the Ford engine, the fact that I knew sort of all about the technicalities of the car, I never felt it was a handicap because I was able to 
turn to the best. So I'm, I apologise. No, not at all. But Ralph was a bright bloke and he got a good team around him. Um, well, we have another... T- um, well, the answer to the other one of his technical, that's no No, no, well. no, it's this one, this one isn't, isn't technical. This is more a sort of a, a, a board level um, decision, I think. Um, so this one's from Peter at Ellen Bogan, I think I've pronounced that right. With hindsight, um, including considering the resources devoted elsewhere in the motorsport effort, was pulling the pin on the C100 development a smart move? Now, the C100, uh, for those that don't know, um, it's it was a sports car. Uh, only about five were built, and it was initially built with a Cosworth DFL V8 4-litre, which was then reduced what to... What happened when AVO, the Advanced Vehicle Operation, making the Mexico thing, when, when, when we had to close that, I went into public affairs for five or six years, and when I came back into motorsport, I was asked, Walter Hayes, the genius, was in America. He phoned me and said, could you do me a paper on where motorsport is in Europe? I'm, I'm getting uneasy, he said. I did the paper, which I remember started by saying, I'm probably ba- breaking every company rule by sending you this, but I sent him a comment, and I put in there that the C100, it, was, it had become an irrelevance. It was been hanging around. When I got back, it, when I was asked to come back in, I asked for a clean sheet of paper, and I don't know where you feel it. If you fly into a place or even drive into a town, I think you can feel the mood of a place, and I think you can feel the mood of a meeting. The board meeting where we cancelled the C100 and the RS1700 TS court, I think it took 90 seconds for the two, and you could feel the reef. Thank God those damn silly things have gone. Now, it didn't apply to some of the escort enthusiasts. For the first and I hope only time in my life, I got hate mail. I got a letter which simply said, to the world's most stupid team manager, because I cancelled the RS1700 T. That's all he said on the envelope. I didn't mind the invective, but you can be critical if they want to. I was slightly hurt that the post office knew where to deliver the damn thing, but (laughs) but there was a sense of relief. And we moved on to other things. It was unfortunate that probably, looking back, the Group B was a crazy category. We all got involved with a wonderful time. Uh, Looking back, to do get 200 sports cars made with a fiberglass body, I don't know how the heck we did it. Although it does make me sad and I have a quiet weep outside because when Group B was cancelled, we got 200 cars. We stripped 20 for spares and we made the others saleable. And I can remember going home to Margaret and saying, these things are just over 50,000, but well, nothing in my life will be as exciting. Shall we buy one to keep as a memento? No, I said, the 180 to sell, they'll never appreciate you see what they're fetching? It's you advertise them in your damn magazine. That's what's called. Yeah, that's sorry about that. <laughs> Rubbing it in. The, uh, we, ha- we haven't even mentioned Groupie. I mean, you know, your, your career has been so long and varied. Um, that we're going to miss out bits. And I know, t- talking of hate mail, I'm sure we'll get comments of, um, of why I didn't ask cer- certain questions. What uh, Group B, you know, I'm, I asked pretty much the same question regarding the escort and that era of rallying. When you're in the middle of Group B, did you... I mean, did you realise how, what a peak that was in rallying's history? Because um, it, w- it was what a special time with so many manufacturers in there, the speeds. We had Bob Lutz was in Ford of Europe, and he was a keen car enthusiast. And I think if we hadn't had Bob, we probably wouldn't have got the thing through. And going back, it, luck can play a part. Going back, the Sierra Cosworth. The previous time, we that uh, that came before the RS two hundred because we needed a touring car racer, and we got. To, I, I suggested to the chairman and president of Four Euro they should meet Keith Duckworth. So we went to Northampton. We are walking to see the Formula One car, and there was an engine with sixteen valve conversion. What's that key? Oh, it's just something we think we can sell a few as a kit. That wasn't a coincidental viewing, I'm sure. Over lunch at a pub local, I said, well, if we put that in a Sierra with a turbocharger, 
Rover won't win another touring car race. And that, because the chairman and president were there, not me, but they were there, that was the germ of the Sierra Cosmos. But to illustrate the point of luck, we've got to do 5,000 for homologation. Britain have got to take a chunk of them. And I was in a room not unlike this, Ford's boardroom, pitching to Ford of Britain on behalf of the Sierra Cosworth. Will you take, you know, turbocharger, this big spoiler on the back, what's that? So the mood wasn't euphoric until the chairman pointed to a photograph on the wall of Jim Clark on three wheels in a Lotus Cortina of Brands Hatch. And the chairman, not me, the chairman said, are you saying that this Cosworth will do for the Sierra what the Lotus did for the Cortina? I said, that's exactly what it will do. Well, I ought to put it in the paper you're reading. He became a convert. Thanks, Jim, because that picture hadn't been on the wall. We might still be struggling. Then we did the Group B, and then the final one, of course, was the Escort Cosworth. Which, which my mum bought new and still drives to this day. She goes to Tesco Cosworth. in it. Yeah, she goes to She actually, she's, I won't say what age she is. Um, she'll hate me and never talk to me again for doing that. Um, but she actually, two years ago, she asked for the spoiler to be put back on the back. She wanted a bit of bit more rear end grip. Do you notice? I'm, I'm Jer- not, honestly not making that Jeremy up. Jeremy Clarkson constantly refers to it as the best car Ford's ever built. Now, I said I'm technically illiterate. To illustrate it, Ford got that car partly because I'm technically illiterate. Because the product planner we had in motorsport, when we got this clean sheet of paper, Group B's cancelled, what the hell are we going to use? Mike Morton drew up a chart showing all the cars and what the... This is Fiesta's too small, Granada's too big. No, there's nothing there. And like a technical idiot, I said, could we take a Sierra Cosworth, take the body off, shorten it and put a new Escort body on? And I can still hear the laughter of the engineers. So we went back to the chart. Fiesta's still too small. Granada's still too big. And reluctantly, and I tell you, well, it might work. And we, I realised we were never going to get that through the company on paper. So we had one built, knocked together, took it down to, took it to the Borum, and Stig Blomquist was quicker in it than any other car we got at the time. So I took it to Ford head office and keys to the VIPs. And they all came back from the A12 or the M25, big grins. Fantastic. Now go away and think of something more sensible. Taking a body off, splitting it, nonsense, it was a ludicrous. And eventually people came round that that might work and that's how we got the thing. So I'm glad, congratulate your mother on her good, <laughs> yeah, on her good taste. Of car. I've never actually met a customer before. <laughs> Just uh, on, on Group B, I, I wanted to ask, obviously a lot of fans look back nostalgically on it and maybe regret the pulling of the plug on on, uh, on it, but uh, what was the atmosphere at Ford like when they decided to uh, stop uh, uh, Group B? Um, I've heard that there was a sense that actually it was a relief because of the expense of development and uh, uh, and, and this kind of arms well, race that was going on. It was quite r- a relief to get out of it. Uh, th- there was an element of that because, <coughs> excuse me, there was no direct relationship to the production cars of the Escort Cosworth. You could at least pretend it had got something to do with Sierra Cosworth, all of those things with this Group B. But it was, a, you know, I think it's a great tribute to Ford that they're prepared to do things like that. They're exciting. It was a very interesting time. But, yeah, the, uh, um, a gentle sigh of relief. And of course, don't forget, sadly, w- as well as the accident with Toivonen, we had a crash in Portugal which killed people. Now, when we start, before we started actually, um, you drew attention to your tie, um, which I, I will get this wrong, but it has the letters ECF on it and a, what looks well, like you a got fish it wrong, stripped to its it was bones. supposed to be a s- s- spontaneous comment, you see. I t- t- I'm not that <laughs> professional, I'm afraid, Stuart. You're, you're dealing with a ham fisted <laughs> presenter here who has to just wedge things in as well, and when. The tie in the 50s and 60s, teams had the the Scuderia, there's team, there's. Squadra that people do, and John Sprinz and I had the rather 
upmarket idea, we would form a union. I think the Grand Prix Drivers Association was formed there. We would form a union of 50 top rally drivers, Squadra Cinquanta, and we arrogantly would pick the 50. So, I mean, how crazy. So, we got our, it deserved our comeuppance, and we got it because two northern lads, Roy Fiddler and John Hopwood. Roy Fiddler was in fish. As a contrast to Squadra Cinquanta, they formed a Curie Cod fillet. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is, they've got a reunion in, a, in a two or three weeks' time, and they've done something that motorsport sometimes forgets. They still bring humour into the sport. A sport can't just be deadly. The nonsense we see today in Formula One, it's a money machine. It's not a, where's the entertainment? No, no wonder people are turning away from it. Well, you brought a lot of humour to the last hour. Um, and I, I was just going to finish, unless Joe wants to jump in with anything, on your, you know, there's been s such, a, a, so many things that you've done over your career. Can you pick a single highlight looking back now? Group B, the first time I sat in one was at Myra Handling Course. Jackie Stewart was the first person, non Ford person to drive it. And I saw him wink at the engineer and said, sit in. And I got in and I know he was going to try and scare me. What he didn't realise, being a poor driver, if, if Sterling Moss rang me now and said he was going to drive up Everest, I'd sit with him in a 2CV and if he was going to drive down every... So to sit with Jackie in a Group B car was sensational. The next day, the same car at Boreham, Stig Blomqvist drove me around the rally handling court. So I sat with two world champions in 24 hours. That was a bit special. The other thing was nothing to do with motorsports or... When I was involved with the public affairs side of it, we used to take journalists off on trips to try new cars. And we took four separate groups of journalists to Bordeaux to see the factory and to see a new car. And each night we took the four, we, we took the group of journalists to the chateau, wine tasting, lovely meal. And for four consecutive nights, I had the privilege of standing up and saying, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. And we got them near Bordeaux in the French countryside, did a cabaret for us for four nights. One night, the chateau owner and his wife turned up, and whether it was because she was extremely attractive or not, I don't know. When we'd finished the evening, a Ford colleague and I were putting the journalists back on the coaches to go back into Bordeaux. We got back into the room. Dudley had gone back to his piano and started improvising. His backing musicians, who'd packed their instruments away, unpacked them and started backing him. And cut a long story short, a Ford colleague and I, the Chateau and his wife, and Peter Cook, were at a half hour Dudley Moore improvised jazz concert. You Amazing. Couldn't, couldn't have planned it. Well, you, if you'd planned it, it wouldn't have worked. It, it, with the, oh, and halfway through, I said to the Chateau, What should we be drinking? And he fetched his best, whatever it was. I tell you, the hell with rally. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it sounds exactly like the World Rally Championship nowadays. I don't think anything, anything's changed at all. Stuart, thank you so much for such a wonderful hour of reminiscing about, about your time at BMC and Ford and, and so many other things. Joe, thank you so much for, for joining us on your very first talk show. Uh, hopefully see you on many more. Uh, we'll be back next month for another talk show in association with motorsport, and we'll see you all then. Many thanks for listening.